Let's start with the cephalometric uh, radiograph. It's called a lateral ceph, and we look at it for a number of reasons. In the past, we looked at it purely from the aspect of um, maxilla to mandible. Now we can look at it uh, from the aspect of how much growth is remaining because of Frankie and Barchetti's research on cervical vertebrae. Um, we look at airway issues associated with this, uh, not that it's an ideal um, diagnosis, but you can get a two-dimensional view of tonsils and adenoids to see if they're contributing to blockage of the airway. We can also look at soft tissue, and by soft tissue, in particular, that line that we draw now from the chin to the lower lip, which will determine whether our case is extraction or non-extraction. But the biggest uh, value we get out of the lateral ceph is the dental division, or interincisal angle, uh, and position of maxilla in relation to anterior cranial base. The reason anterior cranial base is important to us as diagnostic clinicians is because the anterior cranial base is a primary growth center. It's a synchondrosis, which means that for most uh, children, its growth is complete by age seven. So by age seven, we have a landmark that allows us to see where that patient's facial growth is heading. That allows us to see where the maxilla is to the cranial base, whether it's too far forward, too far back. And then once we know where the maxilla is, we can then determine mandibular position. Uh, I recommended the textbook, uh, Hans and Enlo, Essentials of Facial Growth. And if you read that book, you get a very good understanding of the timing of facial growth and how synchondrosis are the first areas to complete then we have pre-maxillary growth, then we have maxillary growth, and finally mandibular growth. So what we're looking at now is static views off a, a, a skull so that we can put the pieces together to make a determination of where we're heading. Now, there's a hundred different cephalometric analyses. And when I did my orthodontic training, what was very popular uh, was the Ricketts analysis and the Steiner analysis. What I try and present nowadays is an analysis that answers more than just what we're gonna to do tooth movement. In traditional orthodontics and the way I was trained, most of our uh, work was done with moving teeth. And therefore we were interested in uh, millimeters of crowding, we were interested in arch lengths, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, most of the orthodontics we teach is related to early treatment and particularly related to dentofacial orthopedics. So it's better for you, if you're following that approach, to use an analysis that will allow us to determine uh, size of maxilla, position of maxilla, you know, when can I use a reversible face mask, what is the latest stage I may be able to translate a mandible, uh, what do I do in a class two vertical grower? Now, these questions really help the clinician who's going to do some uh, pre-orthodontic orthopedics. In my practice, our patients really fall into one of three categories. They can have um, airway problems, and we sort those out with our enos and throat doctor, and we teach the patient to change their tongue posture and breathe through their nose. And that's what I would call myofunctional therapy or um, orthotropics, guidance of growth. The second aspect of our practice is trying to modify adverse facial growth, like expanding a narrow maxilla. That would be orthopedics, and that's best done during the ideal growth of that bone. And the last aspect is um, orthodontics, which is movement of teeth. Now, I find if you look closely at the orthotropics and closely at the orthopedics, and you do those well, the time you spend in fixed brackets is minimal. And on top of that, no amount of great tooth movement is gonna give you a great looking face. If the face has adverse growth and you wait until growth is complete and then you start your orthodontics, in no way will you be able to um, improve the facial profile. Even in a non-growing individual, cephalometrics is important based on mechanics. If you have a vertical growth tendency, your mechanics will be intrusion in nature. Two terms. The CEPH is the actual x-ray. The CEPH tracing is what you'll be 
doing to interpret the data. When you present cases to me, either on a memory stick or via the website at Full Face Global, I don't want the tracing over the x-ray. Uh, what I'd like is the x-ray on its own, the tracing on its own, and the tracing done with a pencil initially, but then superimposed with a Sharpie marker or a, a texter so that I can clearly see uh, where maximum mandible is. And then you can put the two next to each other and we'll show you that. So some helpful items for tracing, obviously hand tracing is what we're teaching today, but as you get more experience, most companies now have a commercial system of digitizing and digitizing just simply means you can go direct one-on-one. -on -one. But whether you hand trace or digitize, you still need to understand the basic anatomical points associated um, with the skull, and we will cover those. In more advanced programs, we go through three-dimensional tracing. Um, the problem at the moment, we can get three-dimensional photographs, we can get three-dimensional x-rays, but interpretation of that data uh, is not as easy as it is for the two dimension because there are no norms developed as yet. Uh, there are no standard tracing. So if you do have a cone beam machine in your practice, I would suggest that you get the appropriate software to be able to print out a lateral CEF, to be printed out a um, OPG, to print out a frontal PA skull. So when people ask, well, which tracing should I use? Um, I like user tracing that answers questions above and beyond standard tooth movement orthodontics. So we want you to be comfortable with the tracing. The tracing that I recommend and I've been using for many years is the tracing developed by Dr. Jefferson. And Jefferson looked at Sassuni's work, realized that yes, that's a value, but it's quite complicated, and basically came up with a modified Sassuni analysis. It's not difficult. I would say it takes average five minutes to trace an x-ray. It's important you do the first couple of tracings yourself before you send it out to a lab, because if you send it out to a lab, you're relying purely on their accuracy. You need to be able to critique that yourself. I'm gonna go through some cephalometric landmarks. Um, before I do, I want to very quickly review what information we hope to get from these landmarks. What I like about the Jefferson tracing, it doesn't matter about your racial background, whether you're a male or female, um, or uh, the age of the patient, okay? And this is important because most of the analysis you see there, rickets, tweed, et cetera, um, are based on cephalometric norms, uh, Caucasian norms, uh, Negroid norms, uh, Asian norms. But in this day and age, particularly in a country like Australia, which is very multicultural, what cephalometric norm will you use for a child that is, um, mum is Thai and, and dad is English, okay? Um, there is no mixed norm for that thing. However, the Jefferson analysis will allow you to do that. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Josh has finally published a, um, a tracing manual associated with the Jefferson analysis, and, and that's it, give him a plug, that's it there. Um, I'd strongly recommend you get that because it's just got everything in there. It's basically a summary of his uh, excellent article, uh, as well as practical approaches in tracing. So, so I don't use Steiner anymore, simply because this, I guess, as far as I'm concerned, is easier, gives me more information, and I can use it in every racial type, because his analysis is based very much on the um, understanding of facial proportions, what uh, he calls divine proportion. And I just want to explain a couple of other things. With most of the analysis that are popular amongst orthodontists, they drop a vertical uh, tangent from nasion, and that's normally at 90 degrees to Franco horizontal. So really, the sort of the face that they're they're setting up is going to be a flat face. Does that make sense, right? The Europeans, particularly the early functional people, such as uh, Bimbler, uh, such as Frankel, um, they believed in a, in a fuller face. 
Uh, and so they use what's called an arcule analysis. And the Jefferson is an arcule analysis. And the benefit of that is when you draw an anterior arc, you get a better idea of what is a good looking face. And this is where some of the problems arise in orthodontics between extraction and non-extraction. People who use a analysis which just drops a line and are happy with a flat face, of course, are gonna say that most people have bidental protrusion or a maxilla is too far forward. And I think the way I can explain why that is useless is when you look at good looking people um, and you apply the two types of tracing, you'll clearly see that the arcule analysis predicts that their face is good looking. Whereas the traditional analysis uh, will actually predict that they're too full. And remember, the initial analyses and some of the work that was done by um, Peck and Peck, uh, the type of face that is popular in the modern world is different to what it was 50, 60 years ago. People want a fuller profile. You know, Andrew Jolie is the sort of uh, pin-up uh, face that people want. They want that full lip structure. And uh, even Rob Ricketts, when he initially did his E-line, would draw a line from the chin, soft tissue, to the nose, and he'd have the upper lip two millimeters behind and the lower lip four millimeters behind. His more modern E-line was the nose, upper lip, lower lip, and chin all on the same plane. Okay, so this is where things vary. You need to know why we need these things. For instance, SN, right, is the anterior cranial base. And we need that as a reference landmark. It's in the mid-saltral plane, stops growing by seven. We can relate all sorts of things to it.